Today we're going to be talking about active learning. Thus far in the class, what we've been talking about can be called passive learning. So what happens here is we have a bunch of data. We give those data to an expert. That expert gives us labels. And of course, you want to do all the things that we talked about in terms of making sure that you have inner annotator agreement and so on. But then those labels go en masse to your machine learning algorithm. That algorithm examines the data, combines information from features and the labels to create an algorithm. This is a very linear process. What active learning is, in contrast, is, again, you have a bunch of unlabeled data. The algorithm inspects the unlabeled data, and then it requests which data should be labeled. And then the expert annotates those data, sends it back. The machine learning algorithm updates its model. It then asks for more labels, and the process repeats. So this is a lot more complicated. It's no longer a linear process. You actually have a human in the loop. Why do you want to do this? The reason that you want to do this is that active learning can be more efficient than passive learning. This is because when you're doing passive learning, the annotation is being done on random examples. With active learning, if you can make good choices about what data are going to be labeled, you can learn the hard stuff and have less redundancy in the things that are labeled. So this all sounds very good, but how does it actually work? Last week we talked about unsupervised clustering and Naively, you might think, well, we could just run one of those algorithms. Then we get some number of clusters out, and we just label each of those clusters. This could go wrong. Your decision boundary might go through one of these clusters, and you wouldn't know it. So we need to be a little bit smarter about this. There are two broad types of active learning stream-based and pool-based. Let's talk about stream-based first. So in stream-based active learning, at each point in time, you have a universe giving you training examples, and you need to decide at every time whether you're going to ask for a label for that piece of data or not. This is arguably more realistic. Imagine that you're running an e server and emails keep coming in and in and in, and you need to decide for each one whether it's spam or not. The easy cases that the machine knows how to handle, it can classify itself. For the things that it doesn't know what to do, it asks a human. The other alternative is pool-based active learning, which, although it's slightly less realistic, is more widely used. In this case, what happens is you have a large pool of unlabeled data, and your learner gets to choose which out of this very large collection of unlabeled examples it wants to look at. This is more natural if you're doing a post hoc analysis on some data set for which you have absolutely no labels. For example, if you're trying to figure out which of the millions upon millions of emails sent in the Enron Corporation are relevant to a court case, you want to use active learning because the annotator is deciding whether an email is relevant or not are very expensive. They're lawyers. And so you want to look through all of your data and figure out which examples will teach your algorithm how to decide whether a document is relevant or not. In either case, active learning proceeds in rounds. Each round has a current model, and then you need to make a decision about which data point you want to label, or whether, in the stream-based case, you want to label the next example. In both cases, you need to decide which examples you're going to label. Then you have those examples labeled, 
You now include that in the training data and get a new model. And you repeat this process until you have no budget left for getting labels from your expert. This is fairly straightforward, except for the question of when do you choose to label an example? This is called a query selection strategy. There are many examples, and we'll talk about a few of them. First up, uncertainty sampling. So in this case, what you want to do is you have some model that will represent with theta, and you want to choose the points for which you're most uncertain. So what does uncertainty mean? There are many ways that you can quantify this in the context of a machine learning algorithm. If you're doing something like a support vector machine, your uncertainty could be the distance from the hyperplane. For a probabilistic model, the uncertainty might be the probability of a class given your example. So let's take a look at these in a little bit more detail. One thing you can do is look for the example for which you are the least confident. That is, for which example is the largest probability of a class, given that example, the smallest. Another possibility is looking at the smallest margin. Look for where the distance between those two probabilities is the smallest. Another possibility is choose the example with the maximum entropy. That is, for your distribution over classes, what distribution has the highest entropy? If you do uncertainty sampling, you can much more quickly figure out what your decision boundary is. So on the left, we have the true class labels. In the center, we have what happens if you do random sampling with 30 examples. You get a much worse division between your data because you're not looking at the hard cases you're looking at all cases. On the right, we have what happens if you look at only the hard cases and you do uncertainty sampling. You get a much better accuracy, and this happens because you're paying attention to the part of the space that is most difficult to distinguish. Another way of choosing examples for active learning is something called query by committee. So in this case, you have many different classifiers. This is called the committee. Each of these classifiers is making a prediction. We won't go into the details of how you get this committee. But what you can do is you can have each of that committee vote on what it thinks the unlabeled examples should be. And then you choose the examples for which you have the most disagreement. One way that you can do that is to compute the entropy over the votes that the unlabeled examples receives. And then you incorporate those new labeled examples into your model and relearn. One problem with query by committee is that it focuses on outliers. So outliers are hard to classify, but they're not very typical of standard examples. Another way of choosing examples to label is to choose examples that change the model itself. And thus, those examples will be the most informative. So one example of this is looking at the expected model change. If you have some parameters that describe your model, such as the vector of a support vector machine or the coefficients for logistic regression, see which example, if you included it, would change those parameters the most. You can also choose the example that reduces the expected generalization error the most. So if you knew the answer to some data point, how would that change what you expect your error would be? You can compute this by considering all of the unlabeled instances, 
consider the expectation over the labels of that instance, and then see how uncertain your model is once you have that information, and choose the example for which you get the most reduction in your uncertainty. The other alternative is instead of looking at the absolute change in your model parameters, you can look at what examples would allow you to get a narrower confidence interval about what you believe your model parameters could be. Finally, another way to avoid the problem of outliers is weighting your examples with respect to density. That is, you want to choose examples that are similar to the entire unlabeled pool of examples. That is, you want to weight things in terms of typicality. And you can combine this with other metrics to give you things that are both typical and informative. To wrap up, we've talked about active learning, which is a label-efficient learning strategy. When your annotators are very expensive or you don't have a lot of time to build a model, this is a great way to get a lot of data quickly that will give you a good model. There are a lot of variants on active learning out there where you can incorporate some notion of the cost of labeling an example, what happens if you have annotators of different expense or quality, how can you use those effectively, and what happens if you do active learning on features rather than the label. So for example, what if a feature is difficult to compute? As attractive as this is, there are some things that you want to think about. Can you reuse actively labeled data sets to train a different model? What would happen if you did that? And it's obvious that the sampling here is biased. That's the whole point. But what happens after that is that what's labeled doesn't reflect the true underlying distribution. So for example, what if you wanted to know what percent of all email was spam, and you labeled a bunch of examples using active learning? How could you correct for the bias of that? In class, we'll discuss some of these issues. I'll also give a demo of an active learning framework called Dualist. We'll have a discussion of where active learning is appropriate or not, and we'll continue talking about your final projects.